Hello, everybody. Welcome to the channel. I am glad you are with me. Marina's uh, not with me today. She's back in her office hard at work, uh, writing her annual love letter to Uncle Sam and doing her dead level best to keep us out of prison for another year, if you know what I'm talking about. She's getting everything together uh, so we can take it all, all our tax stuff to the CPA and get it all done. We're we usually have it done earlier than this, but she's been, as you know, away from home for the better part of the year so far. So she's playing catch up and burning the midnight oil to get everything done. I'm going to attach some video, some little short clips here in just a moment to this video. I spent last weekend, uh, one day last Saturday over in Georgia, where I went to see, uh, one of my beautiful little granddaughters play ball. And uh, I got to see uh, two of my daughters and uh, one of my sons-in-law. And uh, so I want to share that with you. And uh, so stay tuned because I'm going to insert it right about here. And then I'll be right back and talk about what we're going to talk about today. Stay hey, everybody. Tuned. This is my beautiful daughter, <laughs> Tiffany. Say hello, Tiffany. Hello, Tiffany. Be careful around <laughs> Tiffany. She works for the sheriff's department. <laughs> she can throw you in the slammer. That's right. And we're here to see uh, Emmy, her daughter, play ball. Our favorite athlete. At this sprawling complex. It's pretty nice. And uh, we're going to have a big day, I think. That's so right. uh, I'm glad to be here. Glad to see you. Glad to see you too. Isn't she pretty? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know about that. She got her good looks from me because her mom right. still got hers. There you go. <laughs> I don't know. All right. I love you, baby. I love you. All right. Hey, you may know Tara. Say hello, Tara. Hello, Tara. This is uh, my other daughter, Tara. I have three. Tia is not here. But we're out here uh, at the baseball game for my granddaughter, Emmy. Here's Tiffany. You met her already. Tara is, again, great with child. We got a name yet? No. Maybe. She does. Su Tara suggest does. We don't. She's going to be surprised. We don't know if it's a boy or a girl. So we'll take suggestions down below. Sorry, I'm so oh, sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. So if you got any baby name suggestions, we need them. All right. <laughs> this Later. is my beautiful little granddaughter. This is Amy. She's the ball player. Say hello, Amy. Hi. She is really a good ball player. And she play. what's the name of your team? AP. AP, what does that stand for? Atlanta Premier. Okay. Well, you're doing great. I'm proud of you. Thank you. All right. And this is my good looking grandson. This is Grant. Say hello, Grant. Hey. <laughs> Grant is about to enroll in college, aren't you? I am. Good man. Do you know what you want to study? Hold my thing. Sorry. My, oh, my uh, cup. Probably finance. Finance. That sounds good to me. All right, I'm proud of you. Thank you. Good looking guy. That's Grant. Is he? Is he? Yeah. This is my number one son in law. This is old, this is old Andrew. How you doing, brother? Oh, great. All right. <laughs> I'm proud of him. He's a good man. Aren't they pretty? Go figure. Really good kids. My daughter, Tiffany, is, uh, she's about to graduate with her master's. I, I can't remember if I mentioned that or not. Uh, I'm really proud of her. And my daughter, Tara, is about to have her fourth child. I have uh, my daughter, Tia. T-I-A, Tia. She has four beautiful children. And I think you've met my son, Joe, before. So, uh, I'm proud of all my kids. I really am. And my grandkids, this growing brood that we've got. All my kids are in Georgia. I miss them, but I'm glad to share them with you anyway. Today, I want to talk about the United States Constitution, and I want us to have a little visit with uh, a genuine American hero that you probably know, a man by the name that I'm very fond of, a man by the name of Patrick Henry. We're going to talk about old Patrick here in just a few minutes, but I want to start uh, with the United States Constitution. I want to talk about this uh, for the better part of the, uh, the video today because we have in our nation, of course, the uh, United States Constitution, which was ratified, I believe, in 1788. Uh, it is uh, the supreme law of the land or is supposed to be. Uh, all of our presidents put their hand on the Bible and raise their right hand and vow to uphold the Constitution when they take their oath of office, as do federal officials, as do a lot of 
state officials and what have you. The irony of it all is, of course, that hardly anybody follows it. Um, in Washington, the Constitution is rarely even referenced, much less followed. Uh, presidents in particular get into office and they just do whatever they want to do. Constitution be damned. Nobody follows the thing, it seems, anymore. It's the rare bird in Washington, such as a Rand Paul or a Thomas Massey, that even invokes the Constitution when they are presenting their arguments on the uh, House or Senate floor. Almost nobody pays any attention to the Constitution. It's almost a joke. It's an afterthought. You raise your hand and vow to uphold the Constitution. Then you serve your term in office doing exactly the opposite. Well, I want to talk about the Constitution for a moment because this is a document that we are supposed to be following, but from its foundings, it is a document that is mired in secrecy, controversy, conspiracy, and uh, there were a lot of shenanigans afoot when the Constitution was penned in Philadelphia. Now, let's take a quick review of exactly what the Constitution is or is supposed to be. As I say, it is the supreme document of the United States government. It is the seat of uh, our law. Uh, we have uh, scholars who devote themselves uh, to the study of the Constitution. We have constitutional lawyers and uh, law professors uh, whose uh, ex area of expertise uh, has to do with the Constitution. The Constitution, as you know, is made up of a preamble. Uh, it is made up of seven articles. Uh, it contains the Bill of Rights and it has 27 amendments that you, you are undoubtedly familiar with a few of them. Some are more famous than others. The First Amendment, of course. The Second Amendment is the right to bear arms. Uh, one of the amendments that is really under assault in our day and age is the Fourth Amendment, which has to deal with search and seizure, you know, privacy issues. The Constitution has all was built and has always been built as a document that controls or limits a central government. But the fact of the matter is, folks, that the Constitution does exactly the opposite. It absolutely further ensconces power with a central government, which is unfortunate. There is a tremendous uh, book that has been written. It was written uh, in 2013, I believe it was, by Dr. Gary North that I really commend to you. It is actually available. You can purchase a copy of this book or you can read it uh, online for free. Uh, maybe I can remember to link it down below. And the name of the book is called Conspiracy in Philadelphia. Conspiracy in Philadelphia. And I would like to read the foreword to this book for you, and it reads thusly, on May 25th, 1787, a group of 55 men gathered for a closed meeting in Philadelphia. Officially, it was being convened to discuss alterations to the then Constitution of the United States of the Articles of Confederation. Some state legislatures had authorized their representatives to attend the meeting only on this basis explicitly prohibiting them from considering a new constitution. To make certain that the general public did not find out about the nature of this conspiracy, the convention members swore an oath not to discuss any proceedings with the public for the rest of their lives. The only firsthand accounts of the proceedings were published several years later after the, after the death of the last survivor, James Madison, in 1836. The press was forbidden to attend the Constitutional Convention. The meetings were held on the second floor of the building so that, so that would-be eavesdroppers could not hear anything. The new Constitution would become the law of the land whenever nine states state conventions ratified it. 
This was in explicit violation of the Articles of Confederation, which required a unanimous vote for amendments. Thus did a group of men launch a coup d'etat. This coup established a new national covenant in 1788, a covenant stripped of the Articles' invocation of God, the great governor of the world. With only the old country's name transferred for public relations, the United States of America. Today, we would call this a trademark violation, but it worked. You do realize, I think, that before, we had, before the Constitution, we had a nation. Before the Constitution of the United States of America, we had the United States of America, and we had the Articles of Confederation. If you ask most Americans whether or not they support the Constitution, most of them will undoubtedly say yes. I maintain that we were doing just fine with the Articles of Confederation and did not need a Constitution, but it is what we have. And now, what I maintain is, since we had the Constitution, can, it, can we at least not expect, have this expectation of our leaders that they follow this document? That we have a constitution does not, uh, that we have a constitution does not mean our leaders follow it. They largely do not. So what do we have a constitution for? When you have a constitution which speaks about excessive crime or excessive fines and punishments, and you think about good old Judge Scrooge, Arthur Ingeron in New York, who levied a fine of over $350 million to Donald uh, Trump. This is a clear constitutional violation. And he's a judge. He's a, he is a judge. He should know better. But it doesn't stop these people from shattering the Constitution when they have their own private bias or prejudice that they wish, wish to inject into a case. Gary North writes that the Articles of Confederation, this is incredibly important. Listen to this, please. The, art, the author of this book, Conspiracy in Philadelphia, and it was a conspiracy. Uh, the press, as I mentioned, was not allowed to, con to attend the Constitutional Convention. They were not allowed to report on it. There were no windows in this building. It was held on the second floor so nobody could see what was going on in this convention. Do you know that the Constitution at the time of its passage was extremely controversial? It was not a unanimous vote. Far from it, a lot of people opposed uh, the ratification of the Constitution. I'm going to tell you more about some of these people here in just a moment. But Gary North writes that the Articles of Confederation of 1781 served as a halfway national covenant. They did, they, they identified, quote, the great governor of the world, unquote, as the sovereign incorporating agent. The United States Constitution, 1788, identifies we, the people, as the sovereign incorporating agent. Think about that a minute. With the Articles of Confederation, the sovereign national agent was, quote, the great governor of the world, God Almighty. But we replaced the Articles of Confederation with the United States Constitution, and the power shifted from this great governor of the world to we the people. That's significant, don't you think? Who is the God of America now? Well, constitutionally speaking, it is we the people. Uh, you may think that's a good thing. I do not. The Articles of Confederation nodded to the great governor of the world, to God Almighty. In other words, we saw God as our supreme agent, as our supreme ruler, as the omnipotent, omniscient ruler of the universe. The Constitution says, no, it's we the people. That's quite a contrast, don't you think? That's significant, don't you think? Who is the God of America? Apparently, we the people are the God of America. I don't think that's a good thing. Now, at the time of the Constitution, 
she just left her office. If you want to weigh in on this, go right ahead, sister. Yeah, right ahead. At the time of the Constitution, there was a group of people in America that were called anti-federalist. And the anti-federalist <clears throat> believed, uh, the well, here's who they were. Anti-federalism was a late 18th century political movement that opposed the creation of of a stronger U.S. federal government and which later opposed the ratification of the 1788 Constitution. The previous Constitution called the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union gave state governments more authority. Hello, state governments more authority. You can already see the, the, the root causes of the war between the states. Now, um, this is what the anti-federalists believed. This was their main beliefs. They believed, number one, that the Constitution needed a Bill of Rights. They believed, number two, that the Constitution created a, a presidency so powerful that it would become a monarchy. The anti-federalists also believed the Constitution provided insufficient rights in the courts, e.g., no guarantee of juries in civil cases, nor that criminal cases, juries be local, would create an out-of-control judiciary. Anti-Federalists also believe that the national government would be, would be too far away from the people and thus unresponsive to the needs of localities. Do you think they were onto something? And finally, anti-federalists believed that the Constitution would abrogate, at least in part, the power of the states. Do you think they were right? Do you think they were right? Yep. Marina thinks they were right. They were absolutely right. Now, who were these anti-federalists? Well, these were largely men who opposed the ratification of the Constitution in 1788. Maybe you've heard of some of these men. Samuel Bryan of Pennsylvania. I'm not going to list them all. Samuel Bryan of Pennsylvania. How about this man? John Hancock of Massachusetts. Does that name, name ring a bell for you? He had a famous signature, did he not? James Monroe was an anti-federalist of Virginia. George Mason, also of Virginia, was an anti-federalist. Sam Adams of Massachusetts was also an anti-federalist. And the man I want to talk about right now was also a well-noted anti-federalist. He was a man by the name of Patrick Henry. God bless Patrick Henry. And I want to take a moment right now to visit with this um, American patriot. I'm telling you right now, folks, I wish we could go dig Patrick up and rehabilitate him because we need this old boy right now. Patrick Henry was a patriot. Patrick Henry was a great American. He was an anti-federalist. He should have been president, but he eschewed it. He didn't want it. And he was anti-constitution and he left us with a string of fantastic quotes. I could spend several shows just talking about Patrick Henry. He had flaws. He was not perfect. But Patrick Henry, Henry was a great American. He was a patriot. And I want to give you some of the quotes we have from Patrick Henry, several. And let me start with this one. He, here are, for your consideration, ladies and gentlemen, some Patrick Henry quotes. Let me start with this. Suspicion is a virtue as long as its object is the public good, and as long as it stays within proper bounds. Guard with jealous attention the public liberty. Suspect everyone who approaches that jewel. How about this one? Are we at last brought to such humiliating and debasing degradation that we cannot be trusted with arms for our defense? Where is the difference between having our arms in possession and under our direction and having them under the management of Congress? 
If our defense, if our defense be the real object of having these arms, in whose hands can they be trusted with more propriety or equal safety to us as in our own hands? Preach, Patrick Henry. Now that is an excellent quote. How about this one? It is when a people forget God that tyrants forge their chains. Anybody standing up and saying amen yet? How about this great Patrick Henry quote? The great object is that every man be armed. Everyone who is able may have a gun. Wow. Do you think Patrick Henry would have a chance running for office, national office today, maybe in maybe for Congress, but can you imagine Patrick Henry standing up on a, uh, on a, a debate stage battling for the GOP nomination and uttering a quote like this? My goodness, listen at this. Patrick Henry, guard with jealous attention the public liberty. Suspect everyone who comes near that precious jewel. Unfortunately, nothing will preserve it but downright force. When you give up that force, you are ruined. I'd love to have Patrick Henry for a next door neighbor. How about you? How about this one? Are we at last brought to such a humiliating and debasing degradation that we cannot be trusted with arms for our own defense? Are you falling in love all over again with Patrick Henry? I love this guy. The battle, another quote, the battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is to the vigilant, the active, and the brave. Yes, amen. Another one, the liberties of a people never were, never nor ever will be secure when the transactions of their rulers may be concealed from them. Do you think that quote might make the current occupant of the White House, old Brandon, a little uncomfortable? The liberties of people never were nor ever will be secure when the transactions of their rulers may be concealed from them. How about this quote? Two more. Show me that age and country where the rights and liberties of the people were placed on the sole chance of their rulers being good men without a consequent loss of liberty. You know where I'm going with this, right? I saved the best for last. And here we go. Patrick Henry. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and liberty? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, say it with me, give me liberty or give me death. Patrick Henry. Was Patrick Henry not a great American? Was Patrick Henry not one of our most quotable Americans? Would you love to have a government full today of Patrick Henry's? And Patrick Henry was an anti-federalist who opposed the Constitution. Now, here is where we are in America today. We have the Constitution. It is in place. Regardless of how you feel about it, you may be opposed to a, this Constitution. You may have a preference that we had gone with the, or stayed with the Articles of Confederation or you may be pro-Constitution, that's fine. But is it not reasonable that all of us as Americans should expect our leaders to at least follow what we have? Which, of course, by and large, they are not doing. We have become a lawless nation, and I, have, I cannot help but wonder... Could it be we have become a lawless nation because of the first words of the Constitution, which are, we the people? <clears throat> Pardon me. We the people. 
should should our constitution have started with an acknowledgement of our creator do you think that would have made any difference i think that there is tremendous distinction between the Articles of Confederation, which recognize the authority and the sovereignty of the, quote, great governor of the world, unquote, as compared to we, the people. I think that's quite a distinction, don't you? Anyway, I really wanted to share a show about Patrick Henry with you, so there you have it. Listen, let me hear your thoughts down below. Give me your comments, if you will, please. I would love to hear them. Give me the thumbs up on the old video today. I would appreciate that, and subscribe to the old Triple T channel. Thank you again, all of you that reached out with the Buy Me a Coffee link down below. That's fantastic. I appreciate each and every one of you. Go out there and have a great day. This is Trailer Trash Tim, and I will see you soon.